Let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Ezra, chapter 7. Ezra, chapter 7. And the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, of course, once again, are about the Jews rebuilding the temple and the city of Jerusalem, the wall around the city, after the Babylonian captivity. And they were in Babylon for 70 years, as Jeremiah predicted they would be. But uh, during that 70 years, Nebuchadnezzar was replaced by um, Artaxerxes and, uh, oh, well, what slipped my mind, um, Ahasuerus and the uh, Persian, or Medo-Persian empires. They came along and succeeded the Babylonians, of course, took, it, took over their kingdom and rule over their kingdom. Uh, both of, all of those men, types of the Antichrist, who will set up an image to himself one day in the tribulation. Do I know exactly what the image will look like? No, because I'm not planning to be here. Yeah. But uh, let's read uh, Ezra chapter 7 and verses 1 through 10 tonight. Now after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Seraiah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Meraioth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishua, the son of Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. You remember him, right? <laughs> this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nephinims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came, this would be Ezra, and he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem. So it took him four months to venture from Babylon to Palestine, or Jerusalem. <coughs> And uh, verse 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. We'll stop right there. These first 10 verses give very greatly condensed uh, biography of the author, of Ezra. <clears throat> Just as with the first five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, what we call the Pentateuch, God may have called upon other writers to fill in certain places in the narrative. Moses and, Era, uh, and, and Ezra excuse me, are the respected authors of this book and the ones attributed to Moses. I um, want you to run, however, back to Joshua chapter 19. Joshua 19. And one verse there, verse 47, it says, And the coast of the children of Dan went out too little for them. Therefore the children of Dan went up to fight against Elishim, and took it, and smote it with the edge of the sword, and possessed it, and dwelt therein, and called Elishim Dan, after the name of Dan their father. And uh, the tribe of Dan was naming a lot of cities after their father, Dan. But that verse, obviously written by someone after the fact, go back to Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34. And uh, let's read verse 1. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab under the mountains of Nebo, 
to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan. Jump down to verses 5 and 6. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in, that would be God. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Well, obviously Moses couldn't have written those verses. So those verses were probably written by Joshua after the death of Moses, to completing his story. So God used other people to write um, some of these parts of these books, uh, but the, the primary author remains the same. And uh, so here we have Ezra spoken of in the third person. Notice the words he and him and his in um, Ezra 7, verses 6 and 9 and 10, instead of the words I and me. Um, his narrative, however, does return back to the first person later. Notice chapter 8, verse 1. <clears throat> These are now the chief of their fathers, and this is the genealogy of them that went up, that went up with me from Babylon in the reign of Artaxerxes the king. <clears throat> the main thing to note in these ten verses tonight is that not all scribes were bad guys. There are good scribes and there are sorry scribes. And by the way, scribe, the word scribe is simply the anglicized word uh, version of shribe. Which is our last name. Um, so the, the word shribe means to write in German. Uh, most of the scribes in Christ's day were arrogant and proud and self-righteous. Go, if you will, to the book of Matthew. Chapter 23, Matthew 23, and uh, begin there, verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. By the way, let me stop right there. I'm going to read verse 15 too, but that's what the Roman Catholic Church has historically done when it came to prayers for the dead. We'll say a mass on behalf of your dead loved ones so that they can more quickly get out of purgatory and go all the way to heaven. They, they um, um, devour widows' houses. Some lady loses her husband, but she's a diehard believer in that religion. And so she pays the church a little bit to say a mass in honor of her dead husband so he can leave purgatory get that over with and go all the way to heaven. And, um, and I mentioned this in the past, but when the lady dies, now the children have both dad and mom to pay for masses to be said. And uh, you, know, you can see how that would, if the whole family were diehard believers in Roman Catholicism, and uh, whatever the priest directed them to do, they would do, then the grandchildren would then inherit the duty of paying for grandpa and grandma and their parents when they die. <coughs> this is in banking what's called the uh, compound interest. <laughs> it builds on itself over time. Uh, but there in verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold, twofold more the child of hell than yourself. You know what? And I don't mean to just single out Catholicism, but they're a big target. 
And uh, they've painted that target on themselves. So we might as well take aim at it from time to time. Uh, when they send missionaries to other countries, uh, particularly less developed, primitive, backwards countries, whether it was Vietnam decades ago, they didn't exchange their their ancestry worship, they didn't exchange their their idol worship, they simply switched the names on the statues. Uh, and started, you can find statues of, of, of the supposed Virgin Mary over at the Catholic Church right here in town that was um, offered, paid for by the Vietnamese group that, that meets there. And you can see those, those statues of Mary have Asian features on the face. And so they don't, and in and Haiti, Haiti, they say, is 95% Roman Catholic and 100% Voodoo. The State Department and other missionaries that have been to Haiti uh, testify that this is the way it is. So they never, they never clean up the corruption, the, the paganism. Uh, they simply find a way to adapt those people's superstitions into the Roman Catholic mythology. And now they get it all mixed up together and become twofold more the children of hell than they were before. But Christ said this is what the scribes were doing in his day. Um, he called them blind leaders of the blind in Matthew 15, verse 14. But uh, I shouldn't have lost my place. Keep your finger there in Matthew 23. Yeah, I shouldn't have turned. Matthew 23. Even Christ recognized that some scribes would be good guys. Look at Matthew 23, down at verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. He understood some would be good guys in the future. In Jeremiah's time, this was the case as well. Run back, if you will, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 36. Jeremiah 36. And here he tells us about the one taking down Jeremiah's narration. Everything God had said to him. Baruch is his name, verse 26, Jeremiah 36, verse 26. But the king commanded uh, Jeremiel, the son of uh, Hamalek, and Sarah, the son of Azrael, and Shilamiah, the son of Abdiel, to take Baruch, the scribe, and Jeremiah, the prophet. But the Lord hid them, verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burnt in the fire. And there were added besides them, besides unto them, many like words. So Jeremiah was a very careful, careful or rather Baruch was a very careful scribe to write down everything Jeremiah uh, dictated to him. And by the way, this is a good uh, section here to show you that the Word of God are not the originals. The Word of God is the book you have to deal with and you hold in your hands. That's the Word of God. Because yeah. verse 32 says the second copy didn't match the original. The second copy had words added to it which the first copy undoubtedly uh, evidently didn't have. And uh, it was burned. And not only that, but, but the second copy, God told him to bury it later on in the ground. Well, how do we come to have a record of the entire story if that second copy was buried in the ground? Obviously, there was a third copy someone had uh, put together, written. Now, look also um, forward at chapter 37, Jeremiah 37, and verse, uh, verse 15. <clears throat> 
Wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah, and smote him, and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe. For they had made that the prison. Verse 20. Therefore hear now, I pray thee, O my lord the king. Let my supplication, I pray thee, be accepted before thee. Thou cause me not to return to the house of Jonathan the scribe, lest I die there. So Baruch was a good scribe, uh, dic writing down what Jeremiah dictated to him, and a Jonathan, a bad scribe, who evidently allowed his house to be turned into the new jail without much protest. Um, in our modern times, there are good scribes and there are bad scribes. There are some people who believe that the words of God are divine, that the, the words that they hold in their hands and read in their own language are not simply a good product. They're, they are the divine words of God. And I've said this before, it's not my job to change the Bible, it's the Bible's job to change me. Amen. And <clears throat> let me read to you, um, let, me have, let me compare for you. Some of your Bibles may have this and, and others may not, depending on the publisher. That is the epistle dedicatory, the dedication page. It's called Epistle Dedicatory to the Most High and Mighty Prince James. By the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, etc. And uh, depending on the Bible publisher, some, company, some publishers still print it, others don't print it at all. But uh, if you have a Bible published by Oxford or Cambridge, both of those uh, royal publishing arms uh, print it in the front of every King James Bible. Other companies, Thomas Nelson, forget it. Uh, Holman Publishers, no. Zondervan, no. Uh, they'll print the King James Bible, but for some reason they don't like the Epistle Dedicatory. Because if you read that Epistle Dedicatory, the King James translators take the Pope to task for trying to corrupt the Word of God even in their day. But the Epistle Dedicatory and the second, how many of you have it in your Bible? Just show of hands. Well, let me read it to you. The second paragraph, it says, But among all our joys, there is no one that more filled our hearts than the blessed continuance of the preaching of God's sacred word among us, which is that inestimable treasure which excelleth all the riches of the earth, because the fruit thereof extendeth itself not only to the time spent in this transitory world, but directeth and disposeth, disposeth men unto that eternal happiness which is above all in heaven. And then the last paragraph says, The Lord of heaven and earth bless your majesty with many and happy days, that as his heavenly hand hath enriched your highness with many singular and extraordinary graces, so you may be the wonder of the world in this latter age for happiness and true felicity to the honor of that great God and the good of his church through Jesus Christ our Lord and only Savior. And uh, that's what the King James Bible is. It's the eighth wonder of the world. Um, a book with over 400 years old now with no copyright. Anybody can print it anytime, anywhere, and no one owns the copyright to it. And yet it stayed essentially unchanged. Oh, it's gone through different editions, but they changed the font size, and they, they uh, made uniform the spelling of a lot of words. And those are the primary cosmetic changes to it. But the text is essentially the same. Uh, let me read to you <clears throat> from the introduction to the NIV. 1978. And they say here, let me find it here. Like all translations of the Bible, made as they are by imperfect man, this one undoubtedly falls short of its goals. Well, why are you selling it to us? You know? Yet we are grateful to God for the extent to which he has enabled us to realize these goals. They don't believe the word's perfect. They don't believe it's divine. They don't believe the hand of God is on it. We've done the best we can to realize these goals and for the strength he has given us 
and our colleagues to complete our task. You know, it reminds me of President Obama, how many times he would refer to himself when giving a speech. That guy, his favorite words were me, my, I, mine, I did this, I did that. But they say, like all translations of the Bible, made as they are by imperfect man, this one undoubtedly falls short of its goals. Well, why would they say that? Well, because earlier they say, there is a sense in which the work of translation is never wholly finished. That's to set you up for the next updated version about two or three years later. They've updated the, the uh, NIV. They have, it's now called the TNIV, today's NIV. And they have an NIV where they've eliminated the masculine pronouns when referring to God wherever they can, wherever the sentence allows them to, they eliminate that. So we don't want to offend uh, women who might take offense. Uh, we want to be gender respective uh, when addressing God in the Bible. That's not a Bible. It's simply a product. That's right. Uh, that, is, that, that shows the, the attitude of the scribe who considers what he's, what he's entrusted to work on to be the words of God and someone who's looking at it as sort of a translating project. You could call it a you know, college, college project or some such endeavor, but it's not a Bible. Um, and and I, I mentioned to you a couple weeks ago, get two or three ideas for sermons that kind of on the drawing board at the same time. And I can't just crank one out in 30 minutes like some preachers can. Uh, it takes me two or three weeks to come up with, to write something that I think is worth preaching and worth listening to. And I'm working on a sermon now on the language of the King James, or the, the praise that the King James Bible has, has received and it, which it deserves. Um, if I had thought about it, I would bring book from down the hall in my little office that you wouldn't believe the praise and the, the accolades that our Bible has received from people who didn't even believe it. Because of its power, it shaped the English language. It shaped the English-speaking world. We're, um, we're watching uh, reruns of uh, Andy Griffith last night, and there's an episode where, where Barney's going to buy his first car, and... Um, he sees an ad in the newspaper, and it sounds like they're scribing a car for sale. That's, just, that's the old handwriting on the wall, Andy. Buy a car today. Well, handwriting on the wall is a biblical expression. We say that uh, when, when, when Jacob left Laban's household to travel back home, it said Laban uh, hotly pursued after him. Well, that's what the police do. They're in hot pursuit after some suspect. And just goes on and on and on all over the place. And um, it's, it's, it's shaped night. It's the language of kings. It's the language of... The King James Bible represents the, the developmental acme, the developmental apex of the English language. It, it never was in a more pure and elegant form than it was between the covers of our Bible. No other... I mean, it, it outstrips... Shakespeare for beauty and smoothness and its fluid, uh, fluidness and, and uh, ease of reading, ease of pronunciation, and uh, ease of memorization. Uh, it's poetic, therefore it's easy to memorize. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You can't memorize scripture if it's difficult, to, or if it, you can't do that if it's difficult to memorize, I should say. But uh, verse 6 back in our text this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. We mentioned last time in chapter 6 that the enemies of the Jews fell silent, and they were under threat of death if they should hinder the rebuilding project that the king authorized. They sent letters to Artaxerxes getting, trying to get him to stop this rebuilding project, and he researches and studies that a decree had been made by Cyrus before him to go back to uh, Jerusalem and begin to rebuild. 
And so he authorizes everything the Jews needed to go back and rebuild, to restore the priesthood, everything to supply the temple. And the Jews were now under threat of, or rather the enemies of the Jews, were now under threat of um, execution if they should get in the way and hinder this rebuilding project. That was a great motivator, I'm certain, on their part, to keep their mouths shut from that point on. They even offered to help the Jews rebuild. But it says in verse 6, Ezra was certainly a ready scribe. Uh, scribe is related to the words script, scribble, even or, uh, uh, scripture, and even scribble. And the scribes were the Bible translators, as necessary, revisers, the keepers of the, the sacred books, at least they were supposed to be. Ezra was ready because of what we read in verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. He had prepared his heart, not just his head. A believing heart on the part of a believer, a Christian, will yield more fruit and spiritual understanding than an overeducated head that's come to doubt and question and be skeptical of the Word of God. A believing heart. If you approach the Word of the book you're holding as the Word of God and say, I'm going to believe every single word in it is there by that direction and the hand of God. I'm not going to doubt a single word in it. I'm not even going to doubt the punctuation. I'm just going to believe it all to be as God wants it to be. Now I'm asking the Holy Spirit to teach it to me. Amen. A believing heart will yield much more understanding and fruit uh, in your life than all the book knowledge, all the book learning. The world doesn't speak first century Greek. The world, but Hebrew is not the universal language of the world. English is. I mean, the, the idea that Jews in Israel are speaking Old Testament Hebrew today, that's a separate subject, because God's getting ready to restore the Jew back to his, his land when the, the time of the Gentiles comes in, according to Romans 11.25. Uh, but English is the universal language of, of the world. There are, there, are, there are more people in China wanting to learn English as a second language than there are native English speakers in all of Europe. That's because China's got one and a half billion people there. And in fact, this Bible that I have was printed in China. Even though they're a communist country, no religion, we have some missionaries there, and they have to be very careful about having their services with new converts they win to Christ. But uh, I have no doubt in my mind that somebody working at a publishing company in China, desperate, desperate to learn English as a second language, probably took some of their work home with them. And were reading the Bible and uh, came to know Christ. Came to know the Lord. I don't have concrete proof of it, but I, I know it as a metaphysical certitude, the way God deals with people, and the way God moves on hearts. That's the way God does things. Yeah. There is no country in the world that can keep the Bible out if God wants it to get in. No country in the world. They've tried. Uh, Brother Andrew's story is remarkable. Going to uh, Romania during the Cold War, <coughs> he pulled up to the border checkpoint in an old Volkswagen where they had the, the trunk was in the front of the old Volkswagen VW Bugs. And he pulled up to the border checkpoint and his prayer was, God, in your word, you made blind eyes to see. I'm asking now that you would make seeing eyes blind. And the, the package tray in the back window, the back seat of the car, the floorboards were covered with Bibles. And the trunk was filled with Bibles. And the border guards would look over his passport, his paperwork, and then they'd inspect his car, look in the windows, lift the trunk, close the trunk, and not seem to notice a single Bible in that guy's car. And this happened on more than one occasion. We have, a, we have a missionary we were supporting. He's not, we don't, we don't support him because I don't think he's um, on the field anymore, but he was living in uh, South Korea and he had a business passport to go across the, the DMZ to North Korea and he ran a, a, a bakery, a bread bakery there. 
and he was shoving little bits of Korean gospel into the dough. And these people were buying his bread and taking the gospel home with them. <laughs> and um, there's no... My dad and I, my dad probably remembers, we had a guy come here. Years ago, we had a men's meeting on Saturday mornings. And a guy named, uh, oh, his last name was White. I can't remember his first name. He's the head of, um, oh, what's that ministry that monitors Christians being persecuted around the world? Um, something might, it slips in my mind. But he wasn't that high up running a Christian organization at the time. He just came to give his testimony. And years earlier, he had tried, he, he thought about wanting to witness, wanting to get the gospel to people, but he didn't know what to do. So he got a bunch of little bags, that, the flotation bags, that, that he put gospel literature and tracts in, and they were watertight. And he got hundreds of these things, and he went off the, the coast of Florida and tried to figure out the tides as best as he could threw all these into the ocean, hoping that the tides would carry them to the shores of Cuba. And sometime later, Tom White, I think is his name, Tom White. And uh, sometime later, he and a, another brother were in a small craft airplane flying, I forget where they're heading, but they had engine trouble, had to make an emergency landing in Cuba. And uh, of course, when they got there, they were arrested and detained, rather, and he got into a jail cell in the third level of lockup. There were guys that were reading the tracks. Right here. Hey, man. <clears throat> well, I'm just earlier. Um, one of the, one of the um, missionaries we support, um, <clears throat> I have a mental box tonight, um, Brother Dunlap. Dunlap? No, not Dunlap. No, 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 no. Um, now it's going to irritate me talking to you guys. Brother Eubanks, Brother Bill Eubanks. Bill Eubanks, he learned to fly an airplane, went through private pilot's training, got his pilot's license for one purpose, and that was to fly over the Vatican with a bag full of tracks, and he dumped thousands of tracks over the Vatican. Of course, they detained him and told him never to fly in Italy again. That's okay, he did what he wanted to do. And if any place needs tracks dumped on that place needs tracks dumped on Good aim, the Vatican's the smallest country in the world, he, he hit his target. And, uh, so, as I said, there's no, there's no country in the world that can keep the gospel out, that can keep the Bible out, if the Lord wants it to get in. But a believing heart, and William Carey said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And a believing heart in the scriptures will prompt your thinking to say, what, Lord, what can I do for you? What, what talents do I possess? What skill do I have? Uh, what clever idea could I come up with to get the gospel someplace where it hasn't gone before? Or to, to use my abilities to their full potential for the sake of winning others to Christ? And, uh, so there's, we should never limit God's ability to inspire the hearts of people, especially when you believe the book you're reading to be the word of God, and no questions asked. 